Good morning, everyone. Hi, hello. My name is CJ, and I am here yet again with another uh, art video for us to take a look at, you know, maybe learn a thing or two from. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to be watching a time lapse of my particular art process with this particular illustration. And of course, I'm going to be narrating, uh, talking about what is going on so yeah uh, this is gonna be interesting because uh, I typically make notes uh, before I do any voice recording um, but this time around we're gonna skip all that and just gonna go straight to narrating so I'm gonna try and remember um, my train of thought and everything that had went through uh, or everything that happened um, at the time that I did this particular artwork. Um, bear in mind that this art artwork was done, oh wow, practically a year ago. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm going to be posting this on my social media pretty soon. So but i'm doing the recording obviously ahead of time and by the time that i'm doing this vocal recording it has been literally a year that has passed since i did this artwork so yeah this is going to be interesting trying to remember what happened so but um before i go on and talk about uh some of my favorite topics uh some of my favorite <laughs> topics before i proceed to talk about some of the things i talk about in my narrated videos um we could talk real quick about what is going on in the screen because this 3d part isn't really going to go on for very long um if i'm not wrong this is going to roughly take about 10 12 minutes of our full 30 minutes uh, of time lapse so um we could just talk real quick about what's going on and right now what is going on is me posting this particular character that i created uh, through the mb lab plugin it's such a great plugin and i love the fact that it's free um, for the ones who's not in the know mb lab plugin is a human generator plugin it was based off the manuel bastioni lab plugin that existed uh, but that plugin got abandoned and MB Lab got um, became like the the next generation of MB Lab basically. So somebody basically picked up the MB Lab plugin and then did some more work on it. And it, now I think I'm pretty sure it's a collaboration of some sort now. So yeah, but it's really great uh, for being a free product. Um, there's another one that I used to use, which was Make Human. Um, but then I switch over to MB Lab simply because MB Lab is directly plugged into Blender, my 3D app of choice. And so it just makes things a lot easier. I don't have to open up one software and, it, you know, set things up there and then put it onto Blender or export it onto Blender and set things up in Blender. I can do all my setup in just one go. So, hey, yeah, that's very great. So that's what I did. Uh, or that's was pretty much what I did like the past five minutes I created a character in MB lab I post her um, and then now I'm setting up the scene around her um, so basically uh, the next few minutes is just gonna be me just setting this full scene up which honestly this took much longer than I normally spend time on on 3D. Um, well, to backtrack real quick, I guess I could talk real quick about why I'm doing stuff in 3D. Um, I'm predominantly a 2D artist. That is my strength. That is my jam. That is the thing that I do the most. But I do love um, prototyping things in 3D simply because it helps me with perspective. Um, so I don't have to mess around so much with perspective. And the other thing that I love 3D for is the lighting. Um, case in point, um, I'm setting up the lighting right now. And as you can see, you know, I could experiment with lighting um, setups without having to 
you know, draw a lot of thumbnails. Um, if I was to do this all, all in 2D, I would have to do different thumbnails of lighting different or of different lighting situations. But instead of having to do all that, I could just, you know, do a mock up real quick and kind of just mess around with some settings and change some things around and yada da da. I mean, you could see that I'm messing around with some of my lights and kind of messing around with the placement of the camera. Of course, that helps with the perspective again. Um, so you're seeing me move things around and whatnot. So yeah, um, when I do my 3D setup, I typically only spend an hour. It's kind of, I mean, it's not a hard rule or anything. I don't follow this rule like strictly, but I try to for the sake of trying to save time and, you know, for the sake of being time efficient and whatnot. Uh, I typically only spend an hour setting things up in 3D. For some odd reason though, um, and I could be wrong on this because this was a while back. If I'm not wrong, this took me much longer to set up 3D. Now I'm really curious and so now I'm going to go look up. Um, I'm going to go look up the videos real quick and just see how long exactly was this particular um yeah there's no way for me to know how long this video is without knocking out my, oh yeah never mind i see it it's an hour and a half long <laughs> so i went over half an hour over my budget which honestly in hindsight is not actually that bad um half an hour Extra isn't really that bad, but typically I try to keep it around 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, so yeah, but I think part of the reason why it took me a long time for this particular one was because I was working with cycles. Um, as you can see, I'm just straight up um, using cycles. I mean, I could have used EV, but I'm not very good at EV. <laughs> so don't get me started on that. Just I'm not good with EV, so I'm using cycles. I like cycles too. It's a lot more realistic. Um, my computer is not that fast, so uh, I, I wish it was. Like I wish it would render EV in seconds instead of. Well, I mean it does render things in seconds, so I can't complain too much. At least in a viewport. Um, for this particular one, it took five minutes to render using the GPU. Am I even using the GPU? I don't even know if I'm using the GPU on this one. Because for the longest time, I keep using the CPU because I keep forgetting to turn on the GPU setting for the render. So, um, But anyways, going back to my point, uh, and going back to <laughs> uh, talking about what is going on. So in the 3D, I set up a few buildings. Um, I set up lighting. Basically, the main area where the girl is, all the lighting set up on that area is pretty much set and determined. I already knew that I wanted some local colors on her, and that the rest of not some local colors, some call some local lights on her, and that the rest of the lights in the scene wouldn't necessarily affect her. Uh, case in point are the lights from what are supposedly shops. Uh, so I set up a bunch of lights in the background to kind of indicate shop windows is kind of basically what i wanted it to be and obviously those shop windows aren't really going to be affecting her uh really aren't really going to be affecting our main subject because our main subject's too far anyways and then i'm setting up light posts because i knew i wanted light posts um i think i wanted to put uh, light posts on there to kind of indicate the perspective of things um I know that the buildings in the back kind of help distinguish that, but of course, repeating patterns are always great um, in a composition. So that was part of the reason why I added that on there. Um, but yeah, for and then not only that, I also forgot to mention the little rectangular boxes, not boxes, but rectangular objects that I put on the in the scene. Uh, those are meant to be placeholders for people like walking around and whatnot. So, yeah. But anyways, going back <laughs> to 
um, my the reason or the idea behind this this is one of the things I talk about in my videos is where the idea came from so a lot of my practice had been revolving around a lot of speed pains and daily speed pains um, I get a lot of prompts from online um, I've been criticized about it before about not having my own original ideas and whatnot and not working off of my original ideas which you know in a sense i guess it's kind of true because predominantly i have been working off of prompts more than my own ideas that doesn't mean they don't exist um i actually have this huge collection of uh well i have a sketchbook full of ideas that i don't actually ever really share um I've shared it in some of my social media sites before or in some of uh, our groups that I'm part of, but I haven't fully, completely divulged the full sketchbook simply because it's like hundreds of pages, man. I'm not going to scan nor take a photo of every single page. So there's, there's a lot to go through. But I do have a lot of original ideas in, in that sketchbook of mine. But the reason why I mention this and part of the reason why I wanted to talk about prompts is because um, the reason why I do a lot of my artworks based on online prompts that I find is because of the challenge of it. I love it. Especially, um, the best example is Daily Spit Paint. I get a lot of ideas from Daily Spit Paint, right? Um, it's a Facebook group. It promotes speed painting uh, techniques and practices. Not because, you know, it helps you get faster or whatnot, because, I mean, well, it kind of does. But the whole point of speed paint is really just to practice the skill of, like, decision-making process, you know. Um, you can read about the info on the group page. I mean, it's really, really interesting because uh, it, the original group members actually even stated on their info page that the whole point of daily speed paint is to fail, you're not supposed to come up with a final product. You're not supposed to come up with a finished product. You're supposed to fail. And you're supposed to use that failure as a learning lesson. And so um, I do use it to that effect. But again, like I mentioned, I use daily spit paint group in Facebook more as a form of a basis of um, as my inspiration, basically, for for their work. Um, so yeah, a lot of my speed paints that I post online are based off of that. A lot are from Sketch Zone 2, this Discord channel, from Ramin's, uh, Ramin's, Ramin's uh, Sketch Zone group. So I'm part of this group called Sketch Zone and Discord, and we are not totally affiliated with the Sketch Zone podcast groups. So that's a totally different group. They just happen to have, we just happen to have the same name. But um in that particular Discord group, we get a lot of prompts as well. So, you know, I get a lot of my ideas. Um, but the reason why I went off on this whole tidbit about ideas is because this is one of the rare ones where this was just a straight up image in my head that just came out of nowhere. That I was just, you know, really, really, really curious to see. Like out of nowhere, I kind of, you know, saw this image in my head and I'm like, I wanted to explore it, right? And the idea, aside from, you know, portraying a person as new to the city um, and whatnot, but one of the main ideas in my head, and I could be wrong because this was such a while back, like I'm obviously not going to remember my full complete thought process uh, completely. But one of the things that interested me in the composition in my head, because, you know, obviously I was trying to visualize this whole thing. Um, the idea that kind of came to my head is of this girl that is obviously standing and the viewer is looking up towards her. So it's like a low angle view of some sort, right? Um, and that the bottom half of the page is pretty much empty while the top half is busy which is basically what this full composition ended up being as i mean if you look at it predominantly the bottom part of the ground is just plain ground like there's nothing much there and then everything else 
is busy on top. You get the buildings, you get the crowd, you get the light posts, uh, you get all this really fancy architecture that I'm really, really curious as to whether or not I looked up references for this. Because I was really trying my best to remember if I did or not. Um, I almost want to say I didn't look up references, but I highly doubt it because I reference a lot of images when I draw. I mean, it it's a very, very good practice. I mean, it's a really good way to really get some really good paintings and drawings is to look up references. And so, yeah, I was trying to remember if I was looking up references for this or not. But for the life of me, I couldn't remember. But yeah, so the idea for this particular illustration was simply, it was simply a composition idea in my head, you know, everything blank at the bottom, everything busy on top. And so based on that idea, that, that visual idea that was kind of percolating in my head, I ended up with this um, composition. So yeah. And then, of course, I set it up in 3D because I was just like, okay, well, I have to see this. So I set it up in 3D, and then as soon as it was set up in 3D, I rendered an image of it. I imported it into Krita, which is where we are now. We are in Krita. And obviously, I'm doing the outline of the scene. Uh, this is a real quick sketch. Uh, just kind of like the 3D part, I typically do not spend more than an hour on a sketch. I typically do it fast and quick. I know that a lot of the things that I'm going to end up, or a lot of the things in the scene is going to get changed anyways once I start doing the coloring process. There's a reason why I just keep my sketch loose for the most part. But yeah, so I'm doing this real quick sketch. You know, just to kind of lay things down. And then as soon as I have this quick sketch, I'm going to color the scene with my random mech brush with a hue variation setting on it. And look, look at the line sketch right now. Everything busy on top, everything empty at the bottom. Honestly, that black and white right now is looking really good. <laughs> I mean, this is exactly what I had in my head, what I had envisioned my head. And on a composition point of view, it's like really awesome. But then things went south <laughs> after this sketch, that's all I can say. It went bad real fast, real quick. Wish I could talk some more about it um, later on after that weird crash that I just experienced. What was that all about? <laughs> but yeah, do watch the scene because I'm going to go quickly color the scene in and then after coloring it in i will do my smudging thing where i basically smudge my outline together with the colors to come up with this base paint and then as soon as i come up with the base paint that's basically where i you know um do my details on top of you know so basically this whole process i do it fast i do it quick so i could get to the base paint as quickly as i could so I could do my detailing process, which I could talk some more about after we watch this next few moments.
At this point in time, I'm pretty much done with the whole smudging thing. And as you can see, I have my base paint that I work with now. Um, so basically the idea is just to get this one layer with kind of like a fuzzy look of where things are. Um, the background is a little bit more detailed where things are kind of easy to read like we kind of know where everything is but the girl is obviously very very fuzzy and obviously that's going to change later on where you know that's going to change later on when I detail her but basically um the next few things that I'm going to be doing is just basically detailing which my detailing is a three-step process that I repeat throughout parts of the image I basically delineate my edges, which means I make my edges sharper so that the shapes read clearer. Um, you can see that I'm trying to sharpen the letters on that sign. It's supposed to be like some foreign language of some sort. I, I totally made up that script. But you can see that I'm trying to make the, the script read a little better. So yeah, I'm like trying to sharpen the lines. I also accentuate the shadows, which means I darken the shadows if I if the shadows need some darkening, and then I add highlights. Um, so I repeat this process, this three-step process, all throughout my painting, uh, over and over again into all the parts of the painting until I get to the foreground. And then obviously I spend a lot of time on the foreground because that is the focal point, uh, predominantly for the most part. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's pretty much what's going to be going on in the next uh, few minutes. And I'm really surprised that this detailing part went by real fast. Because I'm like looking at the, my time frame right now. And we're sitting it at about 25 minutes into the video. Which leaves about roughly 7 minutes for the remainder of the video. And if this is sped up 8 times, I don't know, that's like what, maybe 40 more minutes of me actual detailing in real time. That's like a rough estimate. <laughs> don't depend on my math. I'm not the most mathematically smart person in the world. So yeah, but anyways, it's probably about half an hour to another hour of me just detailing, which honestly feels fast because Typically, the detailing part is the biggest part of my process, but I digress. I think I was slightly different uh, with this for this illustration. But anyways, I was about to talk as to the reason why this illustration went south. And when I mean went south, that means it went bad um, for the ones who's not in the know uh, with English, with American... Uh, lingo so yeah um the reason why i feel like this illustration wasn't as successful as i was hoping it would be is because of the color scheme i do not like the color scheme and for the longest time i've been getting critiques on color uh, color is my weakest game as of the moment i am slowly improving on it but it took me forever to figure out one of the reasons why my color game is weak. And one of the reasons why my color game is weak is because of the RGB wheel. See, if you do traditional painting like, you know, acrylic oil and whatnot, um, the predominant color scheme slash color wheel that is typically used is the RYB model. And in the RYB model, the cyan isn't as pronounced compared to the RGB model, which is predominantly used in softwares. Um, so in, tr in the traditional art sense, um, what's complementary to orange, which is the predominant color in my, in my painting, right? The complementary color of orange is actually blue, not cyan. And for some odd reason, I mean, it didn't register in my head. Like, it took me forever to realize that part of the reason why my color game is weak is because of the RGB model, right? Like, I knew analogous and complementary, or I knew complementary was, like, right across from each other and whatnot. And so I was thinking, okay, well, so what's right across from cyan is orange, so I'll, you know, they're complementary. No, no, they're not. <laughs> complementary of orange is always actual blue. It's 
all has always really been blue and it's not cyan um and so like a lot of my color models in my previous paintings has just been very very off simply because of that simply because of this color wheel you know i would set things up to be like say an analogous color scheme and then i realized well analogous is okay because they're all right next to each other but complementary always throws me off or split complementary which is my favorite color model to use if i was to do a split complementary of blue i don't even know what that is <laughs> without looking at the ryb model uh color wheel but yeah anyways um this painting is almost over, so I don't want to go over and talk about this whole subject at length. So I just want to summarize the subject. <laughs> so going back to the illustration, the reason why I feel that this painting was a failure was because of the color scheme I use. It is predominantly orange and predominantly cyan, which they're not very complementary. I mean, it's I mean it's an alright color scheme. It's not like it's wrong. You know, I'm sure Henry Matisse would love this piece because Henry Matisse is all over the place with his colors, man. You know, so he's going to be like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, look at my paintings, you know. Um, so I'm sure it's not terrifyingly horrible, you know. But it is definitely far from what I had originally intended it to be you know I, I wish that my color game was a little better a year ago um, now it's slightly better and it's slowly improving and I'm really hoping that I could you know get better and better at it because honestly it is my weakest the weakest part of my illustration skills but yeah um just to critique this particular painting that I did. Even though I love the composition, and like I mentioned earlier, that black and white sketch was awesome. I mean, it was perfect looking at it. It was exactly what I had intended it to be. The colors obviously just messed everything up. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, the illustration's not that bad. I mean... Aside from the color issues, altogether it's it's pretty decent. Um, there's some perspective issues in her face. Looking at it now, I, I feel like that face could have been worked out a little bit more. It could have been done a little bit better. Um, I could have actually used the 3D model um, that was rendered and I could have heavily referenced it instead of just coming up with my own. But Obviously, I decided to just come up with my own. So, yeah. But altogether, it's a decent illustration. Not one of my favorites. Not one of the best, for sure. Uh, it could definitely be improved. But, hey, it's definitely a great art lesson for me. So, and I hope it's a great art lesson for you, too. So, yeah. But, yep. This illustration is almost done. I'm uh, obviously saving it and just wrapping things up. And yep, there it is. It's done. Thank you guys for watching this with me. I hope you learn a thing or two from it. I uh, will catch you guys in the next video. Like and subscribe. Good night. <music>